Hello, I'm Edscar and I'm slightly out of frame and today I've got my uh, 3D printed Soviet vehicles out in force. I have my uh, T20 that I painted on stream a few months ago, a little while ago. I also have my BA64 armoured car that I named Stalker because funny. And today, one one vehicle that I've always wanted and uh, have finally got around to doing is a Kachusha rocket launcher on a gas truck. So, let's have a quick look before we get started. Uh, this is a resin 3D print. Um, it's actually a collection of three different STL, or well, sets of STLs, three different creators have made uh, Katushas and I've kind of taken bits from all of them. The main body and the rails are from one set, and the wheels are actually from a different set, which is why the axles don't quite fit. But so long as it looks good, they don't have to rotate or anything, I'm fine with it as is. The one thing uh, that it does need is a bit more work kind of in here. I can actually take this off and show. Um, the frame here just did not print very well at all. You can see all of these uh, gaps and failures and lumpy bits from all the supports. I've, uh, with bits of sprue and cocktail sticks, I've uh, uh, fi fixed it all together. Um, but what I want to do is, kind of here, it's just kind of a, a stick going into the flatbed of the truck. I want to add a little bit of framework. Um, I need to find some uh, reference pictures. Because uh, I think on the, the, the Gaz particularly, and some of the other versions of Katusha, there's actually an adjustment to be able to turn it left and right. And while I don't necessarily want the ability to turn it left and right, I want to at least have something more interesting than just meh, a flatbed with a stick attached to it. That doesn't look particularly interesting. Um, also of interest is, again, part of the failed print, is one of the rails is only half, half of the length. Because I think, I suspect, that this was off of the edge of my 3D printer screen. So there's just this little bit that uh, didn't print properly. Now, there's a couple of things I can do. One thing I want to do certainly is have some rockets being launched. Like having the rockets being uh, launched off and having the, the rocket trail sticking out. And I can probably, if I glue like a rocket here, I can probably have the trail and cover it and make it look like it's or make it, making it so that you can't see that it's a gap. Or maybe I can have a rocket like spinning off and it's damaged and, and wrecked and stuff. That might be another option. Anyway, this, this part needs some work is what I'm getting at. And so for most of the stream today, we'll just be painting the, the truck. The writing on your chat window is super out of focus. Are you watching in a low resolution? Uh, I'm streaming at um, uh, 1080, fairly standard uh, resolution. Uh, so just check to make sure you're actually viewing in 1080 as well. I do have my wet palette here already. And some paints. I'm going to paint it in the same style as the others, which is, if I can get the light on it, yeah, you can just about see it at the front here. There's patches of darker green, like you can see I've used a, a desaturated military green primer, and I've painted on some patches of a darker green, and then I've spotted in black, uh, orange, and silver, or uh, grey rather than silver, to be damage to the paint job. So I'm going to basically do the same kind of thing. I might throw in a, a lighter green as well. 
because these are uh, this one and this one painted in the same style. I actually went through quite a bit of edge highlighting with the grey at the end, so the armour panels on this are quite well defined. Anyway, let's get started with that dark green. Yeah. yeah, that needs a bit of a mix. A Russian heavy armoured car for your orcs, says uh, 40k guy. That sounds cool. Refresh the stream and it's uh, it's back in business. Cool. So everyone everyone's doing uh, their own hobby at home, which is fun. Make sure we're roughly in focus. Yeah, I can bring it in a bit. There we go. That's better. So where do I start? Well, edges of panels are a good place. I think that there's a lot more um, open panels on the gas than there is on the other two that I've painted. So I might have to do some mid, particularly on the roof here, this is probably the largest space. Might have to have some extra patches in the middle rather than just at the edge. If I can get some like from the front it might give the impression of damage that's accumulated as it's been driving another useful thing for the uh, the darkest colors that I'm putting in first is to get into like the panel lines like right here just so that they can be uh, picked out because that darkness will stay all the way to the end uh, but it'll be a lot more subtle uh, when we're done than, uh, than it looks now kind of at the moment that looks Pretty harsh and horrible, but as you can see from these, it all ties together nicely in the end. Okay, guy hates the uh, British weather. Uh, yeah, my sister's been wanting to prime some models for. Oh, yep, yeah. <laughs> yep, yeah, spraying. Same, same thing. Um, my sister's been wanting to prime some models for a while now. The whole weekend. Now, I have sprayed models when it is snowing on the ground. And I have primed models when it is uh, raining, so long as you uh, have the models covered so that the rain doesn't get on them directly. But when it's windy, when it's windy, you, you kind of can't. Britain. I've started to spell Britain with the uh, with the glottal stop as a hyphen, just because it's funny.
Um, one thing that you do have to do, and I've actually found this is best in any weather conditions, uh, but particularly when it's colder, um, if you're spraying from like just normal spray cans, um, warming the can is actually really an important step. Um, don't use like boiling water or anything like that. Just get some hot water from the kettle, like 40, 50 degrees, whatever it is, into a bowl and put the, uh, um, the, the can in that for a few minutes. Give it a proper shake. And I've never had, there you go, yeah. Um, so you do the same thing, a pan of hot water before, yeah. It still cracks. Interesting. Um, what brand of, of spray paint are you using? Because I've used quite a few in quite a few different... Cracking. It may be... Um, it might be also that, you, that it's going on too thickly. Because one of the things with priming is... You you only it only needs to be there to hold on to the the paint that you put over the top. I know in in this case in this example I'm actually using the primer color as the main color for the vehicle. Um, but in a lot of cases you're just using it to hold hold the paint down. So you want a very very thin. Oh oh okay so you, yeah there's your problem Games Workshop. Don't 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 use Games Workshop products. They are they are not worth the price tag. Um, I can't remember. My, my sister got some recently at, at our lo local hobby shop that is good stuff. But I can't remember the brand. Um, <clears throat> Halfords do. Uh, Automotive primer, um, which actually does go on really nice and thin, so that's there. That's available in uh, black, white, grey, tan, red, British racing green, of course, uh, and a few other colours besides. And it's you have to make sure you get the matte ones because the gloss ones, obviously, gloss will just ruin your everything. Um, but the Uh, but the matte ones are absolutely fantastic. There's also high coat. High coat. I think it's high coat. Uh, I recommend staying away from plaster coat. Uh, that's plaster coat with a K. Um, good for other applications, but not for. Doesn't work well for mini painting. I actually have recently got um, a can of, of the Army Painter Tan. I'm not sure exactly what colour it is. Um, it's for my my Soviet infantry that I happen to have here. And I was hoping for it to be... like I wanted it to be this kind of colour. But as you can see on these models that I haven't quite painted yet, the, it's more of a, a bone, like an off-white. It's much lighter than I wanted. Where was I? Ah, yes. So there's this um, kind of detail here. I think this is the hinge for the, like, for opening the front to get the engine. It might not be. That's that's the logic I'm going with. Let's get. Uh, and just what I'm doing at the moment is edging around it. <clears throat> which will make sure that when I'm done there will be a very subtle dark edge around it all. I think I probably want to do the the ridge on the front of the hood, the bonnet hood. Ooh. 
do both sides of that. So again, it doesn't need much. But just when that's uh, when that's all done. Yep, see you in a bit, 40k guy. Sometimes just random bits where edges are, not the whole way down the edge. Just for uh, some color differentiation, when I get to the radiator grill here, I'll do this in maybe black. Some of the hinges and handles will uh, will get silver or non-metallic metal rather. Let's just find some spots that I've missed. some stuff on the door here. A couple of dings and straight scrapes in. Kind of also do all of the edging as well. One thing I haven't fully decided on is the window. We've got there's a window in each door and a windshield as well. And I might do like a really simple cartoony uh, like blue reflection lines sort of thing. spaces that's a big open space and a, a resin drain hole as well that I obviously haven't sealed up um, I'll probably glue something on top of that I think we've got about the right 
quantity and like the right amount of surface area covered so maybe a few bits that uh, are a bit open and a few bits that are a bit cramped but a little variety and variation is gonna help so I don't want to make it too even oh, I've got some horrible layer lines there or uh, sorry not layer lines the uh, the grid lines from the pixels there we go just about there Eek. yuck Apparently everyone dropped offline for exactly the same time there. I wonder if that was a network problem. Um, if anyone can still hear me, do shout. Seems like I'm still online. Anyone in chat? Okay, good. Thank you, Foxy Mets. Not sure what, uh, what's going on, but. Some glitch in the matrix somewhere. Actually, one thing I can do here, even though I haven't built it yet, I'm probably going to make some kind of turning mechanism. So if I roughly scribe out where that's going to be, I can put in a, an arc here that matches the curvature that it would take if it turned. Haha. <laughs> I am le smart. So one thing I've noticed about 3D printed models, um, or particularly off of my printer, is that when I water down paint, too much or, or what I would normally consider too much it has a really strong pigmentation when it's wet I'm pretty sure that when that dries that will become a lot fainter whereas up here where I've done uh, the kind of my usual dilution of paint um, they've gone on and kind of stayed the same pigmentation as they dry maybe a little bit less but not by much we shall test that Remind me later on, and we shall look at this arc here to see if it has faded. Which I think it will, though that's not necessarily true. It might not. Who knows?
at some point I'm going to have to do non-metallic metal on the wheels as well. It uh, kind of didn't come out very well on Cantret. Stopka. Hello Nick, how you doing? Um, this is Katusha. Well, no, this is a gas truck. This is Katusha. Um, the history of the thing is that it is a Soviet multiple rocket launcher. This particular example is an eight rail and it can launch from the top and the bottom. And it can launch pretty much all 16 of them within two or three seconds and then takes five or 10 minutes to reload the thing. Um, but because of the noise that it makes, uh, the rocket engines, the noise that the rocket engines made, kind of a um, sort of a singing sound apparently, which given the audio recordings I've heard is not what it sounds like to me, although maybe that's just the recordings. Um, but the Soviet soldiers nicknamed it Katusha because of, uh, there was a song that was written at the time. I think the song was written before World War Two, but it was all it was popular like at the beginning of World War Two, and kind of the connection was made, and it stuck because there are still like modern multiple rocket launchers that have the nickname Katusha. So I think to answer your question, who is Katusha? It would be. The girl from the song? I guess. It's sung by the voices of death and destruction. Exactly. I think I'm at the point now where I've got enough of the uh, the dark green down. Oh no, I can see a few bits I've missed. We're nearly at the point where I've got enough dark green down that we can start moving on to a color that isn't just more green. That is a support that I need to clean up. And it's not the only one I've noticed during this. Uh, I was so excited to put this together and, and build it that I kind of uh, rushed through um, I like the removing support step but then I've let it <laughs> I've had this sitting on, on the shelf not being painted for months and months um, if you would believe it uh, I printed the Katusha before I printed this and I printed the Katusha before I printed Stalker here and so, um, yes. Working on some bolt action stuff myself. Since that's trademarked, I'm making full auto. Um, given that everything in bolt action is historical, nothing can be trademarked? Or at least the trademarks that, that that would exist have have gone out of uh, gone out of time. I guess you could, like whoever, whatever Russian company built the gas truck, could say, "Hey, like we own the copyright of the design of this truck. You cannot make three D printed versions of it." But oh man, the front of the bumper, like the underneath of the front of the bumper, that is chewed up. Yeah, that's the first part of the print. Let's just let's just fill that whole lot in with dark green, because otherwise it's just going to be grey. I don't think I need a primer got down here either. I should have primed like from the underneath, and I didn't, because I never do.
I've put my paint water in a different place. It's kind of, it's over here now, rather than. And that was the sound of my brush leaving. Yeah, I've put my, my paint water up on the right, so it's easier for me to get to. Whereas I used to have it over here on the left and I have to reach over camera. Um, the problem with that is that I keep on reaching to the left because I haven't got used to it being in a different place. Right, that's enough of the dark green. Any, basically anywhere where there's dark green is where I'm going to be working on for the next few steps. Um, getting all of the damage, the rust and the metalwork kind of on those, those areas. And let's start with black because when I put colors over the top of the black hopefully just the tiniest bit of the black will remain visible. Thank you very much yes that that video took an awful lot of effort um, I can't remember when I did the um, the five uh, battle reports I've done six battle reports the ignore the first one because that was done by itself um, but Paul came down and we recorded five uh, battle reports in a week and over the course of a few weeks after that I edited through them I started the uh, the ghost maker video basically the week before we filmed the five battle reports and effectively what I'd done in the space of two weeks is get um, six hour and a half like hour to an hour and a half videos in production all at the same time <laughs> and so I put aside the uh, the lore video the, the ghost maker one and I went through the um, battle reports which individually took quite a few, long time one at a time but they did take quite a bit of time to do if you notice the gap in between the battle report videos it's two or three weeks between each one if you notice the difference, the, the difference in the gap between them and the last um, battle report to the Ghost Maker video, that is three, three months, three and a half months. That is how much more time. Obviously, I'm not working on it all of the the three months. It's not a direct comparison, but just to give you a concept of just how much went into that. Um, I actually really did enjoy it. I mean, partly because I got to read one of the books again. <laughs> and I like the books. I'm not sure if I'd do it the same way again. Um, it's my best video. Thank you very much. That's uh, that's good to hear. That the effort that went in is uh, is is worth the the output. It's not doing particularly well. It's only got, I think officially it's got fifty views, but uh, looking at the analytics, only about six or seven people have watched it. Because a lot of the views are like clicking on the video, it counts as a view. They see that it's an hour long, and then they leave. I mean, that's normal for my longer videos. They, they always do that. Uh, should we be expecting more work akin to that in the future? Yes, yes. Um, I was just saying, I'm not sure if I'm really going to do like a going through a book lore video in the same way. Um, because that was... 
I don't think I needed to go through the whole book to prove the point that I wanted to make. I could have made a 20 or 30 minute video and still get the point across and still talk about each... I, I, well, still talk about the fact that it that the book goes through each of the characters but not actually go through every single sequence. Um, while it was fun to do, I have the impression that it drags on uh, and that it's somewhat dis disorganized throughout. That's just kind of my impression as I was uh, writing it and, and editing, it, editing it together. Um, I think a more focused topic like talking about like some of the, the, the war gear, um, the camo cloak, the straight silver, just do a video on, on one of those and talk about, oh yeah, it was referenced in this book, it was referenced in that book, it's also referenced in this or that codex or the rule book or some other things. Um, that's going to take a lot more research, but it's something that I can do a shorter to the point video. I mean, shorter, it's still going to be half an hour maybe, so it's still a, a fairly long amble. But that's kind of the thing that I want to do next. Um, that said, I do have two long videos that are not ghost related coming up. And so I'm going to concentrate on those. I don't want to have more than one long video on at the same time. It's just kind of too much to go through. Um, actually, one of them is for the painting handle. My, uh, my overly complicated painting handle. I'm doing a, a video on that. And that's going to be very technical. Trying to make sure I'm not falling into a pattern here. Kind of one of the kind of points about this type of effect that I'm going for is that it has to be at least somewhat random. Or at least it has to have the appearance of random. And so if I just went ahead and filled in the dots along a, uh, one of these streaks that I have, it would form a very natural progression because I'm a very ordered person. And so I'm deliberately, like I'm letting myself paint two or three dots and then I'm very deliberately putting one off to the side, out of place. And I can do a bit more and put like two or three out of place. And then I can put, maybe I can put a few in, in line uh, because making everything random is also not random. And then I can make some bigger and I can make some smaller. And hopefully once it's done, all of that will kind of... Each individual spot will look kind of odd if you look at it really close, but kind of if you look at this close anyway, you're going to be seeing layer lines and uh, grid lines and the 3D print... Um, artifacts one off law question why doesn't Tanith recruit more soldiers on a, on new planets uh, answer, they do. Um, so, a few years after their founding, um, on the Vervenhive, uh, or on, in the Vervenhive Siege, uh, which is on the planet of Vergast, um, 
they the town to take part in the defense of Vervenhive. Uh, Gaunt is actually pivotal in organizing the defense. Um, like th there are scenes where he's up in a a church, uh, like up up in the spire somewhere, and he's got six or seven radio operators around him, and he's just sending orders to everyone getting information sending units around and and kind of being in control um and it, it that's the type of thing that gaunt does very very well that comes across well in the books but that will never come across in the tabletop and it will never come across in a model it's very hard to do that kind of thing I guess you could do a diorama of that sequence, but it's very hard to do uh, like just a standalone model of someone orchestrating an entire battle. However, at the end of the Siege of Vervenhive, when the siege was lifted, uh, <laughs> first and only, I'll settle for thousands and only. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so after the Siege of Vervenhive, the Tanith have taken a great many casualties. It describes them in the book as being under strength. That's the only description there is of it. It doesn't clarify what under strength means. And there's a lot of different um, of ways to take that. Um, I sort of am leaning towards like um at strength being about a thousand but that's not necessarily correct and being under strength is just you have less than a thousand but it could be 500 it could be 2000 it could be a lot of different things um but the tanith are considered under strength at that point uh warmaster Slado Makaroth. Warmaster Makaroth it would have been at that point. Is that right? Yeah, because Slado would have died earlier. Yeah, that is right. So Warmaster Makaroth, at the end of the Siege of Vervenhive, said um, all of the civilians that have been displaced in the war, if you choose to, you can join the Imperial Guard because there's there's not much to stay here for. And especially uh, some of the scratch companies, which are, they're not a official organized military unit. They're just a bunch of civilians who are fighting for their home with captured weapons, with improvised weapons, whatever they can get hold of. Um, a lot of those opt to join, um, they join the Vervenhive planet, uh, the Vergast? Vergast. Vergast. They joined the Vergast Planetary Defense Force. They joined the Vergast um, Imperial Guard regiments. But some of them join other specific regiments. And because the Tanith are under strength, the um, they take in a lot of Vergast um, soldiers or, or Vergast civilians to become soldiers to replenish their ranks. And that is where you get characters like Tona Creed, Elijah Ku, Sorik, uh, Bandar, or Dua, the uh, the captain. Strangely, uh, Bandor, Ban actually transferred from the Vergast PDF to the Tanith first and only. And that's only the first time Because it happened again under very, very different circumstances. Like many years, in universe many years later. Actually, in the real world many years later because the books were released quite far apart. Um, the second incident was, or, or the second kind of merging of, of regiments was the, the Belladon 81st. So, uh, which book was it? Traitor General. 
during Traitor General, Gaunt takes a Spec Ops team and takes Rawn with him. And remember, this is after the after uh, Corbeck's gone. So with Corbeck gone and Rawn and Gaunt on this Spec Ops mission, the regiment is left in charge of uh, with Ban. Um, one of the the, Virga, the highest ranking Vergast in the regiment, and almost as soon as Gaunt goes, uh, the regiment gets unceremoniously dumped in with another regiment. So the Tanith first and the Belladon eighty first become the Belladon eighty first slash first. And it's just the slash first to say that, oh yeah, the ten of first known only are a part of this regiment now. Ron? Who's Ron? Later, Ron? Not now. Later, Ron. Oh, what story was I telling? Belladon 81st, yes. So, Tanith get rolled up with the AE Belladon 81st. Uh, who, and the Belladon 81st are a recon regiment, so it's not um, unreasonable. But essentially, the Tanith 1st, instead of being reinforced, they are now reinforcements for a different regiment. And the Tanith essentially don't exist in their own right at that point. Now, spoiler warning for the next book, Gaunt get comes back, unsurprisingly, off of this Spec Ops mission. He survives. As you might expect, being like the the name in the title of the series. Um and comes back to the regiment being kind of uh, dumped in with the Belladon and he's still technically commander of the Tanith kind of on paper and all of that and so he takes over and is like well the regiment's now called the Belladon 81st first right? Well no it isn't it's called the Tanith first and only so change all the paperwork back the Belladon can stay but they're part of because they're part of the regiment because it's a combined regiment. Um, but no, it, it's the, the Tanith. The, the name of the regiment is the Tanith. Thank you very much. And so at that point, you have soldiers from three different planets: Tanith, Vergast, and Belladon. All combined together into one regiment. Uh, there's also uh, the influx, which is uh, beginning of Salvation's Reach, I think it happens. And that's just reinforcements from uh, Vergast and the Belladon, just more of them join as reinforcements. One thing that I've kind of been wanting to really do a look at, and I don't think there's enough information to talk about this in terms of like a law video, but it's the numbers of the regiment. Like how many, how many Tanith born are there, and how many of the how, like how many are there in total? Because for certain, there's like odd mentions here or there of how many there are any at, at certain points but it's not consistent and I think it's deliberately not consistent because Dan Abner wants to be able to like he doesn't want to say oh there are this many and, and then he's run out of rigor room later on for a different story that he hasn't written at the, the, at the first place so it makes sense to do it this way So we've got 
a great big patch of green here. I can kind of go and even join up with that one. Not Ron, but Ron. Are we talking about how to pronounce Ron? Because if you can 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 find someone with that name and, and tell me exactly how it's supposed to be pronounced, I think Ron is the would be the Irish pronunciation. Uh, but I don't know if it's actually a real name. It's just that there are similar there there are names that are spelled similarly that that are, that are pronounced similar. There's a few uh, names in the Tanith that are somewhat inconclusive on just how you're supposed to pronounce it. Uh, Bellerophon. Bellophon? Belucifilon? A Belucifilon. Belucifilon. That planet. Uh, that's in the lore video. Um, that was the planet where Larkin's story uh, takes place. No idea how you're supposed to pronounce it. I looked at it for a bit. I made a decision and I went for it. I will pronounce it this way. And then once I finished recording... As long as the recording is fine, I will never have to pronounce it ever again. Until this live stream. <laughs> Probably the same as... Reen? Ron? If the spelling Sean. Seen. Yeah, it's that kind of thing. I think it's actually, yeah, I think there is another spelling of Sean. Um, I think there's a spelling of Sean with a W in it. And I... Yeah. And it's not where you expect. It's not like Sean would it, It's It's kind of at the, towards... It's, further towards the beginning like sworn but it's still pronounced Sean I don't know I'm not a linguist or a uh, whatever the name of people who study names is etymologist I guess it would be something like etymologist Sean, 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 and Sean. Yes, thank you, Foxiness. For the many, many spellings of Sean. <laughs> oh no. No, no. Let's not let's not go into accents as well. Because if you bring in accents and if you bring in phonetics, there's Probably a dozen different ways to spell Sean. And if you go with the uh, the Cantan pronunciation of X, you can pronounce you can spell it with an X as well, because that has a C a C, C sound, so Sian. That was probably very poorly pronounced, but you know, hopefully you understand what I meant. Thank you. Thank you. A 
actually, I think the the only time that anyone's name has ever been like the, the pronunciation the pronunciation of anyone's name has ever been said is Creed. Uh, Tona Creed. I think it was actually uh, Darlin Creed, um, Tona's adopted son, and he goes into R.I.P., which is R.I.P. Retraining, indoctrination, and punishment. Um, so, for any reason why, it's basically boot camp for people who have already been to boot camp. And you just have to go through it again for whatever reason. And Darlin being a... Well, being underage and he got to the age of 18 and is like, right, well... We need to get put you through training, and the only way to do that is a, a rip detail. So in you go. And he's talking with someone in his rip detail, and they say, "Oh, Creed, like the Imperial Creed," and that's spelt with two E's. And Darlin says, "No, it's pronounced the same, but it's spelled with two eyes." Segan. Is that also Sean? Is is it also pronounced Sean if it's with a G? Can we put a W and... Can we put an X, a W and a G into a word and pronounce it Sean? Rip sounds like a Slaneshi tomfoolery to me. Well... I, I don't know anything about that kind of thing, so whatever. Um, but no, it's just it's just like I say, boot camp and uh, all of the imperial guard dogma and, and so on and so forth. I'm sure that Dan Abner just wanted to write uh, like that stereotypical American. Uh, boot camp film that they used to absolutely love in Hollywood. Kind of difficult to get into that corner. I think I've got it. It kind of looks like I'm going way too heavy. But once I've got the other colours on, the orange for the rust and the, and the kind of grey for the silver. Um, it covers a lot of it up, so shouldn't look too bad. And I can always add more of uh, more green or more of the other colours. imperfection and I'm just going to include it as rust now it's the best way Edgar the miniature will make an appearance. Uh, today? Probably not. Because uh, that model is downstairs on a shelf somewhere. Uh, I could uh, bring it up for next week's episode. 
and show it off. Um, the kind of the one thing about that model, having looking at it again more recently, firstly, it's nowhere near as cool as it is in my memory, because you know I built it when I was fifteen. But it's also it's a, a pewter model, and so conversions to. And it's a big, thick pewter model, so conversions to that are difficult. I did make some modifications here or there. One of the my one of my war bosses, I cut the shoulder off and put some uh, like servo arm stuff in there uh, to represent um, like an injury that was repaired with a bionic implant. I uh, can't remember if that was the Ed's goal one or the other one. But the big thing that's missing is the uh, the uh, the extra arms. They kind of um, um, there's a mounting point in his back that's gone, or there w there was a mounting point in his back that's gone that two arms attached to that come out from out from his back and over the top of his head, and they have various bladed implements and whizzy death things whatever they are uh, one of them got transferred to my other war boss but I've only got that one the other one is gone so I don't know whether it's it might be in my bits box somewhere it might be uh, it might be part of another model I don't know but I'm not, not really sure where it ended up be nice to uh, repair that. I think the um, Gorgus. Gorguts? Gorguts the Orc. Which one's Gorguts? Hang on. I'm going to have to look that up on I? Gorguts is a Canadian singer, apparently. Gorguts the Orc? Oh! Oh, from um, uh, Space Marine. I have played that. It wasn't very good. No, the... Gorguts is kind of a very stereotypical appearance model Orc. That's an awkward way of saying it. Let me say it again in, the, in different words that make more sense. Uh, Gorguts has the appearance of the models of the orcs. Like, you can tell that Gorguts is... No, no, it's this specific model that they use to represent Gorguts. Whereas Edscar, while he does generally follow the theme, the theme and um, aesthetic of the orcs, of the 40k orcs, he's not... Uh, like obviously, he is physically based on a particular model, but his style, his weaponry are not. Because Gorguts has a custom shooter and a power claw, which is the most boring standard equipment that an Orc Warboss can possibly have. Whereas Edsgar carries a pair of big shooters underslung under his arms like each one is attached to like the underneath of his forearm with an orc skull covering the top of the grip and then the two arms out of his back so one of the parts that I was never going to model this but I did include that in like the lore uh, whenever I was writing about Edgar is that when the ammunition drums for those uh, big shooters ran out he would unstrap them drop them on the floor and then just charge in and punch things because a war an orc war boss that size is still pretty dangerous when it punches and if he ever if he needs to cut through armor or anything like that he's still got his 
like the two servo arms over the top. And then Gretchen will come along and reload the guns and kind I kind of have this funny um, impression of just a a bunch of grots running around carrying these two big shooters trying to reload them and run at the same time following after Red Skull so they're like, oh we reloaded it here you go you can have it and then he shoots for 10 seconds and drops them again because that's how, how big the magazines are <laughs> that, 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 that's just a funny uh, funny representation of grots there's a hair in my brush that should not I mean, well, there should be hairs in the brush, but there should be brush hairs in the brush. There's an extraneous hair. This is now gone. Damage to the front uh, bumper, fender, whatever it's called on the truck. If I just paint the whole thing as like really gnarly ripped up metal, like, if I just go kind of go ham on other colours, like, kind of like it was involved in a like a ram raid over a concrete block or, or something like that where it's shredded the metal of the I mean it's not really visible from the top like you usually look at it from like this angle when it's on the table and you're looking down on it so you can't see it it's only really when you look from underneath that you see it so it's probably not an issue I don't need to worry about it it's fine Do at the back. Have I got everything else? I think so. What are we at? We're an hour in and I've done two colours. That's not too bad actually. Certainly not gonna finish the whole model. If I can get to the point where I put the wash on, that will be very impressive. Um, quite sure we'll get that far.
that is the black done. Other than the bits I've missed, of course. <clears throat> I could paint the tires at this point, but I'm guaranteed, just the way I'm holding it, to do the rest of it, I'll just rub all the paint off of the tires. I did the same thing on, on this, I ended up having to do the tires three times. If I just paint the tires at the very end, it's so much less hassle. Okay, so... Um, still looking pretty extreme at this point. Now let's throw on some orange. Games Workshop pod so, pot so that the lid has uh, ripped off. There's my orange. It's fine. It's just not great. Let's see. Is that how I want it? That is exactly how I want it. So in this scheme, the uh, grey that will go on last is kind of the bare metallic. The black that goes on first is the kind of the damage, or kind of looks like damage once it's done. And the orange is the rust. I kind of want to aim these kind of dots of orange just off center on the dots of black. So you kind of get this impression that the um, the rust is, is blowing through the damage. Oh yeah, I haven't even talked about the, uh, the windows yet. Oh, I think I did earlier. Once I've done the bodywork, what have I got to do after that? Windows, radiators, wheels. And then I've still got to do the frame on top of the whole thing. And as with the other, uh, as with the black before, trying to keep it inconsistent, but also not consistently inconsistent. Trying to keep it as natural 
uh, as I can with the placement of all of this. And of course, this is far too much uh, rust to be realistic. No Soviet in 1942 would let their truck get this bad. is actually coming through on camera very well. It's kind of the black and the dark green are very visible, but the orange is like on camera I can't discern between the original primer and the orange. Let's, let's paint some of the roof just to give you just to see if you can tell. This one here has orange now, and the other ones don't, and it's only very subtly different. I love the reference pictures. Hey, I'm just getting a little drink. Um, a lot of the reference pictures I was finding for Katusha's are the kind of the refurbed ones for uh, museums and stuff, which is kind of a very well, it, it, it's against what uh, what the museum might want, but it's uh, certainly what the uh, the military would want in terms of showing off all of the fancy stuff that they have. Um, kind of the museum would rather have uh, like a not not a reconditioned one. They would want the original finish and everything, and they can conserve it and uh, prevent the rust from spreading and so on. Uh, but by grinding down all of the panelling and repainting it, it's, uh, it's a much nicer looking example in terms of there being less damage and corrosion. But it's there's something about the authenticity as well. Just not quite. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've, I was struggling to find any pictures of Katusha's in theater or uh, or post-war that hadn't been well either they were really grainy black and white pictures taken from miles away uh, or they're uh, kind of the reconditioned ones
He's very spotty. <laughs> Even though it's fairly hard to tell on camera, for me it's actually very easy to spot um, the patches where I haven't done the orange yet. Starting to show up, but just not not as many as as actually, or, or not as much as it's uh, visible in real life. It's all gone quiet for a bit. If anyone has another subject of uh, conversation or just wants to talk about what they're working on, you can uh, pop that in the chat and we can discuss something else. Still alive, good. Good. These do take a long time to paint through. Rendering American infantry for a client. Ah, is that what you're working on with the uh, World War II stuff? Yes. I've realized that uh, I've kind of gone a bit overboard with the Soviets just because I'm really enjoying painting them. Um, but I'm also enjoying the technical side of making extra torsos to use up the plastic kind of heads and arms because my print is not great so printing heads and arms uh, sorry, heads and hands particularly isn't great and so all of the spare plastic arms that comes with plastic kits are really nice for that so I've got if I just grab some examples here's a trench coat wearing I think this is actually a Krieg body 
this guy's got a light machine gun. There's this is one that I put together of a few different bits. Uh, and it's just the body and legs that are printed and the arms and head are from the uh, plastic kit. And then there's also these, and I'll see if I can find a second one. Here we go. This guy's really short for some reason. I think I scaled it wrong. Um, but these guys have the uh, SN42, I think it is, body armor, and it's just a steel plate. Um, but uh, that is something that I modeled myself. This is the reason why I've, I've got Blender now, because I modeled this in uh, Fusion 360 and I wasn't quite happy with how I could shape it. Because it's, it's a very like bent sheet metal um, piece that has like a, a, a roll up at the top for the like padding for the neck and stuff like that. Whereas I'm very capable of making more solid straight line and mechanical shapes in Fusion. Making the uh, slightly more organic shapes is something I'm not as good at. And Blender is the better option for organic shapes anyway. So I now have Blender. I haven't got very far with it yet. I'm still going through tutorials. Foxy Mitz is trying to ply the wood, the wool that she has been spinning. I don't know what plying is with uh, in the context of wool. Is that uh, attaching multiple strands together into a, a heavier strand or is that something else and Nick says 80s and 90s American infantry okay two months probably making more Tanith now that sounds like fun do you have any uh Spin strand T. Okay. Makes perfect sense. Thanks. Outbreak? Outbreak? Ah, ah. Yes. Your cat is called Outbreak and. Outbreak and Quarantine, I think? Or is it Outbreak and. What's the I, I don't tell me I know the other one. I know the other one name the name of your other cat. Lockdown. Outbreak and lockdown. What did I say first? will be cats. Be harbingers of death and destruction. I'm desperately trying to resist the urge to just edge highlight with the orange. Because it, it kind of does look good, but it's also not the effect that I want overall. Particularly not once I've added in the other, uh, the other colours. I mean, I'll, I'll be edge highlighting with a lot of the silver at the end. Lockdown and outbreak, yeah. <clears throat> See, apparently, one of the cats on on my street is called Fence. Um, and fine, okay, name, name, name the cats what you will. This is all very spotty.
does seem uh, a little odd, that one there. It's not quite... It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't follow any lines or uh, line up with anything. It's just, just a random scratch. It's fine to have. Actually, it's probably a good thing to have overall. I don't know about cats, and I'm suddenly finding hairs in all of my paint. It's highly unlikely to be cat hair. There is a small possibility. Hmm. I need to use this track more often. Subway Dreams by Dan Hellig. Did I say that I've got uh, Blender now? I think I just did. I'm still going through tutorials, but I've managed to make a spiky ball. It's uh, kind of very similar to how I imagined it would work, but there's a few differences, and obviously I need some time to learn the uh, the controls and everything. One thing I always find upsetting is that every single 3D modeling software, 3D printing, uh, like slicer, 3D like viewing object program, every single one, absolutely every single one, universally has a different control system. Like some of them you can um, scroll wheel to zoom in or out. Sometimes you have to middle click and then move the mouse up and down to zoom in and out sometimes you have to actually click on the sidebar like a zoom in and out tool and then obviously rotation and panning are different controls Maya industry standard I can't afford that that is a seven thousand pound piece of software like industry standard yeah I get it it's nice but blend is free One day when I become a world famous digital sculptor and I can afford that, I will buy it. I mean, by then there'll be other software that's better, but whatever, shush. It's fine. Wait, is it mo I think it might be Inventor that's 7,000. I mean, Maya still isn't free, but I think it's a different price, actually. I 
Wait, is my other one that subscription? You have to pay every year. Yeah, I can't remember. I definitely looked at Maya and some other software at some point. These dots do take an awful long time, don't they? Strangely, it's still a very quick and expedient technique, but it still takes an awful long time on a model this size. Foxy Mix asks if I've been affected by the storms. Uh, we have not. Uh, we've actually been fairly uh, lucky up here, even though we're on the top of a hill. Um, we are not particularly affected at all. There's been a few trees knocked down here and there. Um, as far as I, I, as far as I'm aware, there's been no real, like, serious injury or. Uh, or, or any serious damage. Um, but I never leave the house anyway, so uh, the outside world can do what it wants. Somehow I managed to get paint to dry on my brush. That is not good.
Edgar the Hermit is definitely correct. Well, I've no reason to go out because I've got nowhere to go and I don't know anybody, so. It doesn't, like, it doesn't seem like there's much value in it. I've now gone totally the opposite direction and have over thinned this paint. So these orange spots are going to be way bigger but also way thinner than all of the others. I can probably throw a few of these around the other parts of the model and kind of balance it out a little bit. Put a few there, put a few here. Just so that it doesn't seem like quite as big a mistake as it is. Have I missed anything? Yep. I think that's good for the orange. And so, finally we move on to the last colour. At long last. Well, I say the last colour. It's the last colour of this particular effect. What are we at? Ooh, 8.45. Yes, well. I certainly won't be finishing then. Uh, on the stream today. Uh, what I might do, if I work on designing a um, the turning mechanism I was talking about for the frame. Hey, 40k guy, you're back. How you doing? Um, what I might do is when when I finish up the stream today, I'll, I'll put this model aside and uh, re like build that that little turning mechanism. And then next week, for the live stream, I can finish it up. That's assuming I can finish it in four hours total. But yeah, we'll have a good we'll have a good go. I don't mind doing um, two in a row that are the same. Like, uh, like I did two cowboys in a row. I probably do two. I've probably done two Tanith in a row at some point. Um, but yeah, I don't want it to just be the same thing continuously for long periods of time. So I can finish up the Katusha next next week, and then the week after. Like even if I don't, even if I don't finish it, then the week after will be something else. I do have a few models that are potential for our live stream. I've got the. Um, What are they called? Blackstone Fortress. Uh, I've got the Chaos Beastmen from Blackstone Fortress. And I want to paint up them up in the style of uh, the Corn Bloodry that I painted on a competition recently. 
which was featured in the last episode of Back to the Crush, the kind of slightly awkwardly edited one. Uh, Nicholas asks, have I ever been to Warhammer World? I have not. It is far too far away and I can't be bothered. Plus, it only has Games Workshop stuff. And so, what's the point? I don't even know what's there. What is what's in? I assume it's a, a shop and a uh, like gaming tables. Probably, I think I've seen pictures of gaming tables. But like, do they have stuff on display? Is it even worth the bothering to go? Probably not. I'm letting myself do edge highlighting now. Now that I'm on the grey. I don't want to do every single edge. That's going to be too much. But a few here and there. Shop, gaming tables, pub food, display hall. Oh, they actually do food there as well. Cool. And uh, display hall. A Warhammer Museum sounds cool to me I mean yeah it would be cool if it wasn't only games workshop stuff um, the kind of the point of going to a museum for me is to see the variety of stuff and there is so much stuff like Nottingham has a massive uh, collection of a lot of people who uh, run um, gaming companies model companies uh, Mantic is in um, Nottingham. Uh, Bad Squid Games is in Nottingham. Uh, Osprey has offices in, in Nottingham. I'm not sure how much they actually do there, though. Um, but, but yeah, there, there's so much else within a few miles. And then you just have the Games Workshop stuff that I can find most of it at my local Games Workshop if I wanted to. So what? So what? It would actually be really cool to see Bad Squido set up. Because I'm pretty sure that she's... Like, she's not a big company with many employees and all that. I think it's just her in her garage doing uh, resin pours. Uh, wait, not even resin pours. She's doing... Um, uh, most of her stuff is pewter. She has started to do resin because the cost of metal has gone up. Um... Yeah, some of her uh, uh, Soviet stuff is really nice. And of course there's guinea pig, like 30 guinea pigs in a trench coat. And who doesn't want that model? Why is my paint not coming off of my brush? That's better.
Who's that? Who's what? Who's who? Um, who was I talking about? Uh, Mantic? Bad Squid? Oh, Bad Squiddo, probably. Um, so, uh, Bad Squiddo is a lady in Nottingham who makes um, properly dressed female models is her main focus. And she's got all sorts of um, like there's historical stuff, like there's Japanese Naginata, um, the, she's got a lot of Soviet, uh, like the female snipers and uh, various other things. In fact, that's how I found her, because I was looking at some Soviet stuff. Um, but there's also fantasy stuff like dwarves and elves and uh, science fiction post-apocalyptic stuff there's it's just a lot of mix of a few different things here and there i would say generally speaking you wouldn't get an entire like if you're doing 40k or, or uh, bolt action or something like that actually bolt action is a bad example because you could hang on let me restate that most of the time if you were playing a battle game or even a skirmish game you probably wouldn't just get bad squiddo models you'd probably mix in a few Bad Squid with some other companies' models as well for the variety. Um, however, if you wanted to do a female platoon in uh, bolt action, you actually can because there's like 50 or 60 different sculpts. Oh yeah, there's also the animals. I should probably have started with the animals. Um, guinea pigs, rabbits, Cats in in twenty eight hero scale. Um, there's also like not necessarily parody versions, but you know I like my pun models. Well, the guinea pigs, she made some guinea pigs with wings and called them Pegasi instead of Pegasi. That's hilarious. And I'd love that. Uh, my sister ended up with quite a few models from Bad Squid. I, I, I had a few. I've got one of the Pegasi. I've got a rabbit as well. Um, my one of my sniper teams from my Bolt Action Army is from them. And uh, yeah, I've got one of the Naginatas as well, uh, the Japanese Naginata. I think now that the grey is going on, you can see it a bit more clearly on camera. The orange has kind of vanished in the uh, camera view. Oh well. It's, it does look quite um, very strange in, in, in real life at the moment. Once we get to the... Uh, the wash, which I don't think I'm going to get to the wash this week. In fact, I'm probably going to roll up in a few minutes' time. Oh, there's also the dice bags, which are fun. Um, so I'm not sure if you can buy actual dice bags from Bad Squiddo. I haven't been able to find any, but you can buy pewter models of like a, a dice bag with a face kind of cartoon character. It's, it's very weird and interesting and I kind of think it's kind of funny. I do hope the resin works out for her because um, the price is going up will kind of kill it. She works with a few different sculptors, so there's there's a bit of a variety of uh, uh, of stuff going on there. Mostly, it's um, I think actually everything that she has is 
hand sculpted. So some of the things may be a little bit dorky, uh, but most of it's really nicely done. Uh, but it is that much more cartoony style that you get with um, hand sculpted stuff in comparison to the more fine detail that you often try to get with uh, uh, 3D printing. I mean, you can sort of tell when a model has been um, digitally sculpted or physically, or, or like manually sculpted with clay or something. They do just tend to have different characteristics. And one is not better than the other, it's just a different style. And I like to have a mix of both. I wonder if I could get um, Bad Squiddo on, on Back to the Brush. That would be... I don't think it'll happen, but that would be very cool. I think it's worth well the thing is the, the podcast is uh, I've asked for you to come on back to the brush for an interview and you said no Nicholas you said no um, the problem with, with, with trying to get people onto the podcast for, for an interview is that we have like three people who watch the podcast um, so for people who like for people who are kind of busy in the industry and, and they're doing an interview kind of the thing that's in it for them is that they get the uh, the advertising out of it and we can't offer that because we have three people <laughs> who watch it <laughs> but still I'll uh The one thing that's been annoying me is um, with, with with the the way that the back to the brush is at the moment. Um, we don't show up uh, on on YouTube search. Hello, Doctor Bongface. Nice name. Interesting. Uh, but yes, you need to pick up your brush again. Totally inspired. Excellent. If all I do is convince other people to paint. And then that is a success. Um, although specifically when we're talking about Back to the Brush, that's the name of our podcast. Here. Yeah, that, that's that's not a that's not a great uh, situation there. Okay. I, I shall cease my playful ribbing and then and. Uh, yeah, that's not nice. Um, oh yeah, uh, back to the brush. If you search for back to the brush on YouTube, it doesn't come up. It is what I was getting at. Like sometimes it does, but most of the time it doesn't. Um, once I managed to get the episode one that I posted on my channel, the episode one that we posted on Ratman's channel, but not actually episode one that we posted on the Back to the Brush channel. Uh, that's the that's that's the best I've managed it with searches, and that's me not being logged in, and so 
someone who's not seen the podcast before is just going to have a hard time finding it because it's kind of I'm not sure like shadow blocked or something I don't know what we've what we've done we've barely done anything I don't, I, maybe there's something that, that I haven't set up right I don't know I don't know what that would be though Right, we've gone nine o'clock, so let's have a few more minutes to let you ask some questions in the chat. And once uh, once we've done that, I'll finish up the stream. Uh, obviously, the uh, Katusha is not done, not by a long way. Um, I was hoping to having all of the uh, the paneling detail done. Uh, I'm nearly at the end of it, actually. I've just got this, this, the grade to do on all of this and some uh, some more edge highlighting. But then, obviously there's the wheels I haven't even looked at, the windows I haven't even looked at. There's plenty, oh, and of course, the actual rocket launcher itself. Because <laughs> this is just the truck that it goes on. Um, so there's plenty more to do on another live stream and we'll do that next week so yeah if i give you all five minutes to ask any last questions you want before i finish up the stream test that green weren't we that I put on with too much water um, but now I've painted other colors over it so hmm. never mind my scientific test will wait for another time I'm sure just finished plying and winding 150 meters of two ply lace weight into skein 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 Question, when is the next back to the brush? And has it been delayed due to Paul's teeth? Um, Paul's teeth has delayed the has delayed several episodes now because uh, uh, I'm not sure what he, he's happy with me to say, but that, that's an ongoing thing. It's yeah, just about kind of wrapped up. Um, we have recorded um, this month's episode and I've done all the photography off for my side and Paul's back to editing. Now that the uh, the incident with the cat and the computer has been resolved by essentially buying a new computer, not by buying a new cat, I notice. Um, I mean, it's picnic. It's it's problem in cat, uh, not in not pro problem in computer, not in cat. Problem in cat, not in computer. Whichever. I was trying to be funny. It didn't work. Move on. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we, we've got the episode recorded and it will go up hopefully on time at the end of this month. But we're not too, uh, too strict about it.
Strangely enough, uh, Paul is right now sending me sarcastic comments on Facebook Messenger. Uh, he's obviously not on the stream. So he doesn't know we're talking about him. We can say what we like. Right here, can I make an arc? Oh, not well. Oh, not well. That's too much. That's too heavy. Oh, I don't like that. Oh, well. I'll fix that at some point. Uh, Dusty is a word that is broken. <clears throat> Apricus and delicate soul. Dusty is a raging menace and has uh, has affected four episodes of the podcast and also several hundred pounds worth of computer. from Dr. Bongface, do you think Bryn Milo was a psyker? That is an interesting question. Um, I actually err on the side of he is not a psyker. And there's there's evidence both ways. Um, the problem is the evidence for is all circumstantial. Um, evidence against is yeah, I guess there's there's it's harder to prove one harder to prove either way just because of his situation um, but he did sit in front of an inquisitor who is psychically attuned who thought he might be a psyker and decided he wasn't uh, so that's that's kind of the the biggest single piece of evidence. But a lot of it is just the way he behaves, the way he goes about things. Like, th there's ideas that he can predict the future, but every time that happens, it's just a very reasonable, logical deduction. Like, ah, um, Gaunt will want the reports in the morning because there's a, a major a battle coming, and he turns up with the reports, and everyone's like, "How did you know Gaunt would want the reports?" And it's like because there's a major battle coming and Gaunt likes to have the reports of stuff. So, um, he might be. I'm not saying it's definitely that he isn't. It's just, I think the evidence kind of points in the into the side that he isn't. Um, Sorik's definitely a psycho. That's, that's undeniable. Uh, what's um, I'm not going to talk about Ratman's teeth too much because I don't know what he kind of wants shared publicly but just some surgery with his teeth uh, uh, that, that's been ongoing for a while and Bryn Milo is the piper from the Tanith first and only what one of the most important characters that Games Workshop forgot to make a model of when they made the plastic set. I mean, I've got the metal on, so that's alright. But Victoria Miniatures just made a, uh, a Piper model with a cloak, which is pretty cool. Um, I noticed that that, uh, that Devic Designs guy that does the 3D printed ones, like, he hasn't bothered with doing a, doing a Piper, because I don't know. Drop, drop the ball on that one. Drop the ball. Zero out of ten. <laughs> Problem with the Tanith is there's just so many good characters. I think we've um, we've come up with a good way of doing it for uh, the fan codex. We've got a good way of including. Lots and lots of characters from the books without having them be massively complicated in terms of rules or, or, or like massively uh, inconvenient in terms of having 
like models with the character keyword in, in ninth edition. I saw that. I saw that, Nick. You can delete that all you want, but I saw that. Just being sarcastic. It's fine. No, uh, but there, there's so many characters that you could that you that you could design if you were gonna like, 3D model them or physically sculpt them, like uh, Victoria Minches does, or, or any of these other things. If you're gonna make th or even just kit bash them, like uh, a lot of people I've seen on Instagram kit bashing various models, there's just no end to the amount of characters that you could. <laughs> Spelling issues. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's no edit on uh, on on the Facebook live stream. I think there is on the comments, YouTube comments, but not on the live stream. <clears throat> right. There's still a little bit to do. I shall do that. I shall finish off the grey off stream, but then I I will leave the rest of it until next. Uh, next week, so that we can continue the story of Katusha and the glorious song that she sings. And like I say, I need to design a thing to go in there because that's a bit silly, just to stick into the. Yeah, I don't like that. Anyway, we made good progress. Um, we're nearly done with the paneling. Like I say, I finished the grey, and then I'll do. Uh, do you guys want me to keep the wash until next month? Because that is really pivotal in how the thing looks. Do you, do you actually want to see that go down? Because that is... I mean, it's it's the difference between that and that. So it is quite a distinction to be made between like how it looks now and how it will look with the wash on. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll finish up the grey and then I'll leave it uh, for next month. Um... So, thank you for the uh, the few of you who have popped past. Um, there's been lots of uh, good conversation in chat, which is nice and fun. Um, the stuff I'm getting up to at the moment, uh, with a video out on uh, Saturday. Uh, actually, last Saturday was one of my biggest videos uh, in a long time. So, if you would like to learn about the Tanith first and only and their origins, particularly the characters, uh, do check out that. Um, and back to the brushes on the way it will be a few weeks so for today with a model halfway completed thank you very much for popping by and I shall see you next time <laughs>